It's so nice to see that so many of you are interested in this, so I'm thrilled and a little nervous. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so my name is Lynn Friedrichs and I'm really passionate about designing um, education that helps all learners get ready for and you know, do things, take action in a future that looks very much like a future of crisis and innovation. And recently I've done that at New York University in Berlin and at United World Colleges in India, so very diverse spaces. And I'm a bit of a pragmat pragmatic idealist, so to speak. I still think education can change the world, and I hope you do too. And one area in which we need a lot of change, actually, is the topic of my talk today. It's what is the digital literacy curriculum that we need, and it's an invitation to design it. So my talk is part argument, uh, part exploration, I don't have all the answers, and part invitation. And in the next 30 minutes, I want to take three steps with you. I want to start with vision. Because when we design a new curriculum, we need to take a step back first and think about what am I designing this for, right? What is the purpose of education right now? And I argue that we need to redesign it. I'm sure many of you agree. Which brings us to step two, strategy. I want to share three shifts that we need to make so that we get the education that we need. And then step three, action. With these shifts in mind, I invite us to come together differently than we have before and design a digital literacy curriculum that is accessible, that is meaningful, and that is relevant for all students so that they can shape the future digital societies that we want and need. So vision. If we take the view from the stars, so to speak, uh, if we take that step back, we realize we do not only need a digital literacy curriculum, we actually need a completely different approach to education. And here's why. Education is the process through which societies renew themselves. That sounds a bit abstract. It's the process through which humans adapt to new circumstances. That's because it builds our capacity to act. That means to participate and ideally co-shape the societies and the communities that we have. So you could say education is the DNA of social change. Right now, these same communities and societies are experiencing what has been called a multi-crisis. So you may think of the planetary crisis and tipping points. You may think of 117.2 million enforced migration right now. You may think of capitalist systems of extraction and surveillance, or the global, you know, the global pandemic that is still ongoing and that will very likely not be the last one that we experience. You may think of wars, or some of you may think of the automation of knowledge and the augmentation of our lives, of our daily lives, uh, which has become much more tangible with recent advances in generative AI, right? These challenges are so complex because they are global in scale. They feel very differently to each one of you depending on you know, where we are and what access to resources we might have. They affect all of us differently. They are interconnected though and they amplify one another in effect, right? And that creates high uncertainty about the future. We know this intellectually but we also feel it emotionally. So I would imagine that many of us, when we wake up in the morning, we feel something like complexity paralysis. So during these times, I would argue then that purpose actually, or that education really has a very clear purpose. We have to move from that complexity paralysis that we're feeling in the morning to complexity resilience. And that means addressing the kind of challenges that I talked about earlier that we face and create better systems in collaboration with others who might be very different from us in expertise, in experience, in cultural backgrounds, in age. And business as usual in education does not deliver on this. Look 
luckily, and maybe you recognize some of the institutions you work for, luckily we have amazing initiatives that do things differently already. From universal design to transformational learning, um, to initiatives like Friday, Jugendhakt, Chaos macht Schule, to school movements like United World Colleges, um, or entirely new university models, uh, like the London Interdisciplinary School, for example. But wisdom is also in unschooling approaches, like complexity university or ecoversities. Which leads us to strategy, part two. My friend and colleague Zaid Hassan has said, strategy is the practice of getting from current realities to desired future state. And I suggest that we can gather from these educational approaches, from these alternatives that you saw on the slide, three shifts that we need to make so that we get better education. Shift one is from schooling to empowerment. And I'll be very broad in these, right, just to set the stage. Schooling from empowerment means we you know, we have knowledge at our fingertips if we have access to the internet. Not everybody does. But, it, no, but knowledge is not enough to, you know, to, to solve all the complex problems that we have. That's why education must shift from cognitive transfer when teachers deliver mostly fact-based or theoretical um, content during a class, very frontal, like I do now, to a more competency-oriented model when students build knowledge and skills and attitudes by solving actual real-world problems. That means that education cannot be about thinking in one designated space, but it has to be much more about doing in multiple spaces. Right? It has to be about doing in different online and offline spaces that intrinsically motivate and authentically engage the entire learner. That means the mind, the body, the emotions, the whole person. And consequentially, that means that the role of assessments has to change um, with that, and not just because of ChatGPT, uh, but because we do not empower all students to take action in these complex times if we just test for knowledge and grade final products at the end of a term or you know, at the end of a degree. We must create assessments that help our students learn how to learn in a changing world, right? And the assessments need to confirm whether they can take action. So a very different assessment conversation that we need to keep in mind. The second shift is from acting in silos to collaborating across difference. And most importantly, as we think about new curricula, I think it's to realize that curricula need to be living documents that are much more often updated, that are co-created, and that are evaluated by more diverse teams. So researchers, teachers, students, sometimes employers, partner communities of schools, right? That's the team that creates the curriculum that matters. And these teams must critically discuss over and over again what do learners really need to know as the world changes? And that might be different from half a year ago. This will lead to an even deeper questioning of the Eurocentric white male dominated canon that we still have, right? And a move to more interdisciplinary curricula that are built around concrete challenges with more diverse histories and more diverse voices. And this is necessary because if we want to address complex problems, come up with creative designs, find our sense of purpose, we need to be, you know, we need to connect with others, um, we need to draw on different disciplines, um, and only then, if, if we bring together the diversity that is in the disciplines and in the, uh, you know, that comes from the other people that we collaborate with, then we have that 360 degree view on the, on the problems that we need to solve. So that needs to be in place in schools. And finally, shift three, from sage on the stage to guide on the side. And by this, I mean, on a foundational level, educational institutions must accept that they don't have all the answers right now and critically reflect 
on their own role and their own responsibilities in a system of power and privilege as it exists now. Only if we do this, and I'm saying we because I'm part of the system, only if we do this can we support truly new ways of learning and being and acting that may challenge our own norms and traditional practices, right? And on a teaching level, education must shift from a teacher-centered approach to a more student-oriented approach. And very concretely, this means two things. We must build the curriculum with our students together so that it works for them. And teachers need to diversify their methods and their roles. They, you know, they should and they will still lecture to give a little bit of input before you know, things are being tried out um, or demonstrate a process that they're experts in. And maybe they even do this in front of the class, like in good old times. Um, but much more often, they must be the guides um, that help students on their own self-directed learning journeys that are interdisciplinary, right? Um, and this will include that teachers or, you know, areas for teachers where they are outside of their comfort zone. And I think that's something that many teachers who have been traditionally trained are still getting used to. Which is why we need to rethink professional development for teachers, not just because of artificial intelligence, but because of everything, right? If we want system change, we need to retrain um, and upscale and go through an identity transition as teachers so that we can support students. Um, and that means that we need the support uh, as we rethink our professional identity during times that are already very challenging for us. And I'm saying us again because I also teach. So, if we make these shifts in education design, um, teaching and learning, then we have the best shot at empowering learners to take action for more, and I quote, sustainable and peaceful futures for all people rooted in social, economic, and environmental justice. That's the definition of innovation by the UNESCO. And I think big picture, this is the design, this is sort of the, the value horizon, right? Or the design basis that we need to keep in mind when we design learning opportunities. That's the bigger picture. Now, let's design a digital literacy curriculum with this complexity and these three shifts in mind. There's a lot of great work out there, a lot. Um, there are studies like the Youth Information Media Studies uh, by the Media Education Research Association Southwest. There's Quelle Internet, Source Internet by Stiftung Neue Verantwortung. There are existing frameworks that we can draw on by the EU and the UNESCO for digital competency and for media literacy. There are theoretical frameworks like the Frankfurt Dreieck. Um, there's excellent literature, for example, by Digital Courage, uh, by Chaos Macht Schule, right? All of this exists. My, but I think the most important feedback that all of us can get is actually from students and from our colleagues. And in my case, that's from United World Colleges and, and New York University. So today, I want to focus on guiding values, competencies, and learning outcomes, and then curricula themes or modules for a curriculum specifically for the age group of 13 to 19 year olds. Um, that's where I just came from. That's my population and my inspiration right now. But of course, we do need a digital literacy curriculum for all age groups, but we only have 30 minutes. So. To get on the same page, um, we need, for a design process, for any conversation, we need a working definition. And I borrow mine from the digital competency framework that was developed by the EU. And it says, I quote, digital competency involves the confident, critical, and responsible use of digital technologies for learning, for work, and for participation in society. The last part is most important. In a democratic system, to participate means to co-shape. Not just to understand and comply and, you know, manage, but to question and criticize and to creatively improve. That's what I take from this definition. Next on, values. 
Paulo Freire has reminded us that there is no such thing as a neutral education process. <laughs> so we are always guided by norms and values when we design curricula, whether we're conscious of it or not. Very often we're not conscious of the values that actually guide our design. And our curricula always communicate these values, whether we know it or not. So we need to make them transparent and critically reflect on them with our learners before we design and as we design. And I want to suggest three frameworks that can guide us as we design a digital literacy curriculum. The first one is for all the Jedis. May the Force be with us. And, it's, and the joke does not translate. I was betting on this. Based on my experience in, in very diverse learning environments, Uh, recently, I recommend that all community members write such a justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion policy together, which highlights how these values should be practiced online and offline. And it should center voices of historically underrepresented and otherwise disadvantaged groups. So, for example, people of color, the LGBTQIA plus communities, but also students with different accessibility needs. Uh, and those who do not speak fluent German, in our case here, or English as the primary in internet language. So it should be in very simple, clear language. And as a living uh, document, it can be sort of an ethical code that also describes how the community will respond if unacceptable behaviors happen, say, cyberbullying or language-based discrimination. Next on. The second value framework that I think is very valuable and helpful are Super's 10 feminist tech principles that many of you may be familiar with already. Um, right now, they work as a set of guidelines for tech policy making um, or you know, technology creation, but I think they also work for digital, di digital literacy education. That's because princ the principles that they, you know, that they articulate Uh, they help us imagine what sustainable, equitable digital futures could look like globally and locally. And they highlight concrete themes for a curriculum. So I'll give you one example. The first one says, climate action and social equity are interlinked. Tech solutions are not neutral. So we need to teach the relationship between climate crisis, technology and social equity in any digital literacy curriculum. Number three, hacker ethics, further developed by the Chaos Computer Club, they specify key conditions for education in school to, schools and universities. For example, universal access to computers and technological infrastructure, open source software, freedom of information. If we do not prioritize these in administration of teaching and learning, Education cannot be democratic, and we cannot teach for democracy, essentially. So, we have a working definition, and we have a value foundation. Next, we need to think about competencies and learning outcomes. We know that someone is digitally literate if they demonstrate certain competencies. And we have assessed these competencies according to learning outcomes for knowledge, for skills, and for attitude, for mindset, for sensibility, right? And the EU framework already suggests these. So again, we have this. Specific competencies for a digital literacy curriculum that we can use. And I quote, digital competency includes information and data literacy, communication and collaboration, media literacy, digital content creation, that includes programming, safety, which includes digital well-being um, and competencies related to cybersecurity, intellectual uh, property-related questions, and problem-solving and critical thinking. These are the, the, the competency areas um, that we can keep in mind. And that I have taken to you know, as a design basis or as a foundation for 10 modules, I'm convinced any digital literacy curriculum actually needs to incorporate. Number one, social media. A young student's brain, and many of you will remember this, 
um, and, and their social identity are in, crucial, in a crucial development phase. Um, so the prefrontal cortex is still developing while students are also trying to... <laughs> I know, thank you. <laughs> while the students also try to figure out where they belong. And most of this uh, happens on social media these days. So students need to learn how to use social media, but not get used by social media. So what's the business model? What's the intention of platforms? How can they use social media to build community and build positive connections beyond filter bubbles and eco chambers and promote causes that are important to them? They also need to understand how to protect their privacy and their well-being when you know, the, the wish to go viral or FOMO become overwhelming. Number two, discrimination and violence online. The 2022 Youth Information Media Plus study found that 75% of the surveyed young adults between 12 and 19 encounter hate speech online, most often on the most popular four platforms or apps, so Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and WhatsApp. So students need to understand what the psychological and the technical reasons are for the increase in hate and aggression online and how online violence or aggression relates to offline violence and aggression, right? There are often continuities. They need to practice self-defense and solidarity with those who are being targeted. And the focus should be on technology-facilitated gender-based violence. Very important, I think. But the bigger question is not just how do we remedy all of this, but how do we build you know, better, more inclusive, respectful online environments. This is part of, of a curriculum, I think. The next module is on relationships online. So sexual self-discovery and self-determination are human rights and processes we all go through all our lives. Um, and so a digital literacy curriculum needs to address how we fall in love online, uh, how relationship live, life might be different or similar in online or offline spaces. How can we build trust? How do we develop healthy boundaries? Uh, how do we flirt? What are healthy and unhealthy sexual education resources? We need to discuss porn. And the self-protection element. What are some signs of cyber grooming? You know, what are steps students can take uh, if someone is being targeted? So in short, social, emotional, and very and positive sex education needs to include the online space. Next on, data protection. Students should learn how to claim and protect their basic personality rights. That is, the right to privacy, the right to self-expression, but also the right to informational self-determination. And the basis for this is to understand how every click and all online activity generates data, who might be interested in that data, and how it might be misused. Students should practice defending that data against online threats, think hacking, think phishing, um, and this can be done as a game. And uh, lastly, um, and this was a big topic among UWC students who come from very different regions, legal systems, and risk factors, what are the implications and the risks that are associated with biometric data collection and surveillance by governments and police? And finally, whoops. And finally, we land in the next module, um, which is on media and information. Today, all of us must actually be better journalists, better fact checkers, and better communication specialists. Digital literacy education also means learning about you know, how we find information in very fast changing information environments to evaluate if a source is reliable or if a news piece is actually complete. Students must learn to identify fake news, including deep fakes as long and as much as that's possible, and understand why conspiracy theories spread so quickly so that they can self-defend and support others. They must make informed decisions about search engines and about bots, and they need to notice and self-regulate when others want to manipulate them, say with clickbaiting or you know, rankings. And finally, they need to know about copyright and Creative Commons as they contribute online.
The next one is on online consumerism. And in this module, students learn how global capitalism currently operates in the digital realm and impacts what they become interested in or what they decide to consume. Concepts like lobbyism and platform economy and corporate power, all of that may seem very abstract, right? But it becomes relevant and interesting when we uncover marketing strategies like dynamic pricing, payback points, uh, online competitions. We want to make informed decisions. So should our students. And this is also the place to analyze the right to repair and how it conflicts with planned obsolescence. IT. The design of our digital future depends on how well we understand what machines are good at and what we are good at. How do machines and humans process information differently? What is data, actually? And how can we you know, get from raw data meaningful insights? This is where students practice basic IT skills, like coding, prompting, file management, IT security, especially for mobile devices. And they also, or they should also engage with the ideological and the practical uh, differences between open source and proprietary systems or software. Coming toward the end, digital careers. This module must take those seriously who want to become influencers um, and discuss how students' role models use technology. It is also the space to discuss why movements like feminist tech or decolonized tech are important for society and for students' lives and diversify a range of role and career models. Um, so, for example, who are the women of color who made important contributions to tech? And students should then also, as part of this module, explore what their careers, what their own careers in tech could look like and which competencies they should focus on to get there. Finally, no uh, curriculum without AI. Students need to learn how to work with AI. They need to know the current state of development and explore the benefits and the risks of AI tools that they have at their disposal so that they can select the most appropriate ones. But education needs to go beyond use literacy, especially when it comes to AI. Uh, students need data science expertise and understand how AI works and how it makes decisions, how intelligent is AI. But they must also take a cultural perspective. What's the effect of media narratives that present AI as magic, right? Or as the threat to extinction? How does it shape how we think about it? If they understand the creation process from uh, resource mining, right, for hardware to algorithm training, do they think differently about innovation and about progress? We need to discuss ethical designs and legal regulation and that means bias prevention, data privacy, and other topics. And here too, the evaluation between a democratic education and open source models. And then a curriculum needs a concluding module, and I think it should be about technological futures. What is the technological future that we want, right? So students should learn about methods that can help them practice foresight. Can they think of a time when a prediction about technology came true? What are the stories that they are reading about and how does that shape their view of technology? Which political and activist actions have influenced tech development? This should be a place for self-reflection so that students can think about what they want technology to be like and the technological futures. For themselves, and, and also for uh, future generations. All right, collaborations needed. To create and deliver and evaluate modules like this, we need multi-professional teams. And we need interdisciplinary knowledge or expertise. That means not only media pedagogues, and I know we don't have enough of those already, 
it doesn't mean only psychologists or social workers or you know many many more IT specialists. It means philosophers, political scientists, artists. So all the subjects coming together in a different way. And most importantly, we need to design all of this with our students. We have many construction sites in education. I think that's, all, that's clear to all of us as we sit here. Um, and creating a digital literacy curriculum that works for all learners is just one. And this may seem overwhelming, but I'm convinced that we actually have all the expertise that we need to be the best partners that we can for our students. We just need to bring it together in a different way. So I want to conclude on some practical recommendations. We need, I think, a core prototype, a prototype for a digital literacy curriculum that should be co-designed by multidisciplinary and multi-professional teams, as I said, and with our students. And we do need a coordinated national conversation about this. I know many federal states are working on this already, and I know there are uh, you know, political challenges and, um, and different positions that need to come under one roof, but um, we need a national conversation with input from promising international models to ensure equity across states and school types. The curriculum could be prototyped in hackathon format, and then you know, we can start with one age group and then scale up. And it has to be designed as an open education resource. Uh, it has to be funded as such, and it has to be connected to all the amazing open education resources we already have. We need a forum to design this with representatives from all the different areas that we have. And we might even need another umbrella structure that can be oriented or can be something like um, NAMLI for the US, which is the National Association for Media Literacy, just as a suggestion. There's much more to talk about, and I'm sure I'm a minute or so over time. Uh, there's more to talk about and build on, and I would love to do that, hear your feedback on what I've shared uh, in the last 30 minutes, take some practical steps, bounce around ideas. If you want to discuss the implications of AI for learning as we know it, then uh, please join Doris Wessels and me at stage two at 4.15 today. And otherwise, let's uh, have a drink at the Badeschiff and continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.